Hello, I'm Dr. AJ Kumar, PhD. I am the smartest mathematician who has ever lived. This is Math for Programmers number two. Um, premise of this playlist, I had a bunch of cool math stuff. 30% of my stuff was real, is really good, and the other 70% is garbage, and it's really hard to find the good stuff among the garbage, so I am taking the formula for the good stuff and wanting to present all of it in a nice linear way. And uh, for now, our first little macro goal is, uh, or micro goal, I don't know. I guess it's micro, macro on some level and micro on another, is um, <clears throat> we want to get to the rotational logic of quaternions. For that, we need to talk about some geometry. Talk about some geometry, we need some linear algebra. <coughs> Sorry. Am I recording with the right microphone sometimes? It uh, looks right. Anyway, uh, need to talk about some geometry after we talk about some, need to talk about some linear algebra, and linear algebra is basically, uh, how matrices work, basically, um, and, uh, before we even get into matrices, we should talk about what goes in the matrices, which are our numbers. Now, normally you use floats for this in most programming languages, um, and floats exist in Erlang, of course, but um, they kind of they break a lot of the basic logic of your program. So let me show you, for instance. Oh, here I still have it up. 0 0.1 plus 0 0.2 is not equal to 0 0.3 in float logic, and that type of thing where basic logic, basic things about logic are not true with floats. That's just I hate that. So I want to be able to reason through things really carefully and really, not necessarily carefully, but cleanly, where I can understand exactly how everything works. And I want you to understand exactly how everything works. So that's what we're going to be doing. So today, so what, the, the, what we're going to be doing instead of floats is implementing a data structure for fractions. And today I want to tell you about um, that data structure. We aren't implementing the data structure today. There's some more, there's some stuff we have to talk about first. Okay, so our goal is to represent rational numbers in Erlang code. Okay, first question you should have, what is a rational number? <clears throat> the answer is it's a fraction. So it's called a rational number because it's a ratio, which is a synonym for fraction, which is also a synonym for quotient. The standard notation for quotients in math is this weird looking Q with a line through it. I I think it comes from like typewriters when you would you would like position the the head over a specific point, hit the Q, and it would, whatever, it would strike a capital Q, and then you would go back and do it again with a double strike. And so it would be slightly off the second time, and so you kind of get this weird, um, I want to say Asperger's effect, astigmatism effect, kind of with the Q, double vision. Um, that's called, that's, um, what I think, where the notation comes from. I'm not sure. Um, but anyway... Hence, uh, that's, that's where the name QAno comes from. It's short for rational analysis, which is my fork of math, which is what I'm going to be teaching you about. I already have a playlist called QAnal, otherwise I would call this playlist QAnal. And the QAnal playlist is mostly just kind of garbage. Um, anyway, <clears throat> so the answer to what a rational number is, it's a fraction. Uh, specifically, what it, well, what's a fraction? It's a pair of integers, A, B, A and B, where B is not zero. You can never, ever, ever in math divide by zero ever. Uh, the reason is because if you try to divide, if you try to divide by zero, it breaks all of the other logic. Uh, you can prove that zero is equal to one. You can prove, you can prove literally anything if you allow yourself to divide by zero. It's ridiculous. You can't divide by zero, kids. Okay. <clears throat> so uh, the usual notation for fractions is the usual notation for fractions. You take the first one, you put it on top. The second one, you put it on bottom, and you put a horizontal line through them. Um, and you say a over b, or a divided by b, a and b are, of course, integers, and I'm, again, our, our opacity layer, you have to start, your bottom, whenever you talk about something logically, has to be somewhere, and for me, the bottom is integer, integer arithmetic, I assume basic things about integer arithmetic are correct, and I kind of don't ask any more questions, because uh, there has to be a level at which you stop asking questions, or else you, you know, turn into a faggot. Um, so what do we want to do with fractions? 
Uh, there's basically two types of things, comparisons and arithmetic. Okay, let's, so start with comparisons. So your comparisons are less than, less than or equal to, equals, greater than or equal to, and greater than. And then your arithmetic, plus, minus, multiplication, division, uh, kind of exponentiation caveat, we are not we are not going to be able to exponent, we can't take, um, for instance, square roots. There's no, um, that's something we can prove at kind of, not at the end of this, uh, probably at the end of the next video. I can prove to you that the square, there is no fraction such that when you square it, you get two. The reason is that what I'm going to talk about is how to reduce a fraction. And uh, what you can prove is that if you can, if you can have a fraction such that when you square it, you get two, then you can't reduce fractions. And, well, we're going to prove that you can reduce fractions. So let's, let's just start with talking about um, how do we determine if two... God, that's so annoying. It's not quite the same width here. Let me just close these and I'll open them back up next time. Okay. <clears throat> so let's just start with equals. Okay. Our first problem. There are many different pairs of integers which correspond to the same fraction. So how, how do we determine if two fractions are equal? This is kind of the most basic question. So whenever we introduce a new thing, we talk about what is it and how do we tell when two of them are, are equal? This is actually a really subtle and fundamental question. Okay, so the problem, first problem we have, there are many different pair, you know, you pick a given fraction and there are infinitely many different ways to represent that fraction. So I phrased it as there are many different pairs of integers which will correspond to the same fraction. So for instance, 1 divided by 2 is equal to 2 divided by 4, which is equal to 89 divided by 178, which is equal to minus 423 divided by 846. Somehow these are all pointing to the same number. Um, and we have to figure out a way to tell whether, you know, you get two pairs of integers, do they correspond to the same fraction? Okay. So the CIA solution, um, and, and anything that involves a CIA, I'm putting it in glowy green, is A divided by B is equal to C divided by D precisely when A times D minus B times C is equal to zero. And what you can do is just rearrange this equation. So you bring the D over, D, and then you bring the B over. So you multiply both sides by D, and then multiply both sides by B, and then uh, do a subtraction, and you get A D minus B C is equal to zero. Okay, this is not good enough for us. Um, <clears throat> we demand, or we need, in practice, in our programming languages, two things, canonical forms and reduction procedures. So let me explain this. Um, this is just going to be a general theme. Talked about it in Sika 9.5 over on the Big Black Canon channel. Uh, there will be a link to that down below. Okay. So this is just a general constraint in QAnal that does not exist in CIA math. Um, it doesn't even, I don't really think, exist in Wildberger's math. This is something that is really, really, really important from computing and doesn't really show up all that much in math. So what I mean is that <clears throat> you take these two pairs of integers, so one-half and two-fourths, okay? As far as the mathematician is concerned, we don't really care about the ambiguity and re representation because these two integers, or these two fractions, these two whatever notations, both point to the same object. These are two notations for the same object, and what we care about is the thing they point to, and how we denote it is really not that important. That's not true in computing. In computing, how things are represented really, really, really matters. So our constraint is that equivalent things must have equivalent representations. <clears throat> Um, and the reason, basically, is the computer is retarded. It only sees two integers. So if we ask, does the pair 1, 2, or the fraction 1 half, equal the pair, or the fraction, minus 1 over minus 2? Well, those two fractions are equal, but if we ask our computer, our computer goes, well, 1 is not equal to minus 1, and 2 is not equal to minus 2, so no, those are not the same. And can you blame the computer? The computer's retarded. You can't blame it. So, anyway, so our equivalents, our equivalent things have equivalent representations constraint. That combined with our computability constraint that we talked about last time, 
those together imply the reduction rule constraint, which is all members of a given equivalence class, or I wrote a, equivalence class as a jargon reserve term in math, so I didn't want to put that in, but all members of a given class of equivalent things, whatever that means, must be reducible to the same equivalent thing. So what, what that means is that we pick a particular way to represent fractions and say any other fraction that doesn't that doesn't fit into this way of rep or how do I say it? What we're going to be doing basically is making sure that if the fraction is negative, then that's the top number in the fraction that's negative, and that fixes this sign ambiguity. And then we're also going to make sure that the two things have no common divisors, and that fixes the scale ambiguity. That's what we're going to be doing. Okay, um, and I, I couldn't quite figure out the right way to articulate it, but, but basically this is just a general theme. All members of a given class of equivalent things must be reducible to the same equivalent thing. And this really is just so that we can use the standard compare equals or pattern equals operator in Erlang. We'll get to the difference between pattern equals and compare equals. That's kind of a weird thing, but I don't ever, I don't know when you ever use compare equals. I, I've only ever used pattern equals myself. Mm. So this is what I just said. Why did I put an ice cube in my mouth? So we can fix the sign ambiguity pretty easily. So if we have, say, these two options, minus 1 divided by 2 and 1 divided by minus 2, these point, again, to the same fraction. So um, what we're going to have to do is just pick a convention. So for... For positive fractions, we just want positive over positive. Uh, for zero, we want zero over one. And for uh, negative fractions, what we're going to decide is that the that the negative number goes on top. Or equivalently, the bottom of the fraction must be strictly positive. Remember, kids, you can't divide by zero ever. So the bottom of the fraction can never be zero. It must, and because of our reduction rule, it must now be positive. So step one in our reduction procedure, if given a fraction a divided by b, where b is less than zero, so b is a negative integer, we will transform that into minus a divided by minus b. So that's the thing with fractions, you can multiply the top and the bottom by the same number. This is actually the whole reason we have to do this. You can multiply the top and bottom of a fraction by the same number, and uh, it's the same fraction. Okay. <clears throat> The scale ambiguity is a little, it's a touch more subtle, but it's not out, it's not outrageous. Okay, so the, the basic problem is one half is equal to, let's say, 423 divided by 846. Okay, so the retard approach to solving this problem is to factor the top and bottom of the fraction and cancel the common factors. There's two problems with this. Number one, it's too slow in practice. Um, in fact, cryptography algorithms now are based on the fact that factoring is generally very, very slow for large integers. Um, and also, so if somebody figures out the factoring thing, a lot, a lot of things are going to get fucked up. Anyway, it also does not work for, for instance, for 0 divided by 3 or 0 divided by 2, because when you factor 0, its factors are 0, and you factor 3, let's say that's a prime number, it doesn't figure out. Now, you could, of course, code a special case for that, but that's annoying. So um, the white man's approach is to suppose we want to reduce t divided by b. Okay. Again, green alerting you to this is a glowy idea. But there, there's, a, there's a glowy aspect to this. This is a white man's idea. But there is a glowy aspect to the greatest common divisor. Namely, the, the meaning of the term greatest means it's not the ordinary ordering. It's not greatest with respect to the or, to the it is not greatest with respect to the ordinary ordering of the integers. That, that was what was screwing me up. Ordinary ordering. Anyway, it is not the greatest common divisor. God damn it. Okay, let me start over. The white man's approach. Suppose we want to reduce t divided by b. Okay, so let's say we have 2 divided by 4. We want to reduce that into 1 divided by 2. Okay? And we, we've fixed the sign problem at this point. Okay, so... Step one in our reduction procedure, fix the sign problem. Step two, we need to fix the common divisor issue. 
5k. And then after that, we fixed all the issues. Suppose we want to reduce t divided by b. Any common divisor of t and b divides the greatest common divide. So th this, this is the key idea, which is why I put a star next to it. Any common divisor of t and b divides the greatest common divisor of t and b. And green, green term is because of glowies, um, and because of the word greatest doesn't mean what it usually means. A lot of math is weird, subtle word games that are played under your nose, and unless you're a mathematician. This is why math is going woke, by the way, because wokeism is all these like stupid word games, um, and that's what math is. It's a lot of stupid word games. Um, <clears throat> and so if there's some stupid word games, I'll put it in green. Um, anyway, so computing the GCD is very fast and very simple. And by very fast, I mean it is logarithmic order in the smaller argument. We'll talk about what order means way down the line, it, precisely. But if you're a programmer, you kind of are vaguely familiar with the O of, o of N notation. GCD is O of log Ns, which is the best, pretty much the best, short of being constant time, short of being constant, logarithmic order is the best there is. Um, it's even better than linear order. So it's it's logarithmic in the smaller argument. Um, and the algorithm to do that is called the Euclidean algorithm. <coughs> uh, so basically what we're going to be doing, first thing we do, fix the sign problem. And with that, we just make sure that the, the bottom of the fraction is positive or the denominator of the fraction is positive. After sign reduction, we divide T and B both by their GCD because any common divisor of t and b divides the greatest common divisor. So if we divide out by the greatest common divisor, we divide, we divide away all of the common factors, and then we're done. Okay, so next video. First thing I have to do, let's zoom out a little bit. I have to convince you of the starred point, which is any common divisor of t and b has to divide their greatest common divisor. That's not obvious, but it's well, it's obvious once you see why, but it, it, it's not obvious a priori. Uh, got to explain the Euclidean algorithm. Then I'm going to show you some code. Um, and I'm going to show you code in two different languages. First language is Erlang, which is what we're going to be implementing everything in. Erlang is a functional language. It's a dynamic language. It runs in a virtual machine. It's kind of a higher level language. Rust is an imperative language, so functional means you basically write your program as a giant function. That's a silly way to, th that's not the best way to think about it, but it's kind of a correct way. Uh, basically means that you don't have shit moving around, so you don't have things like variables and loops in Erlang, which actually makes things easier and cleaner. You'll see that. Uh, Rust is an imperative language. It You give the program a sequence of, you give the computer a sequence of instructions, and it just executes the instructions in sequence. Okay, so we will have the opportunity to compare the two, and for what we are doing, I'm not talking about everything, Erlang will shine. And um, it, I'm not trying to make a dig at Rust. Rust is a pretty nice language. Um, I actually don't know Rust super well. I just kind of needed an imperative language, and I'm like, oh, I kind of like Rust. And so um, I just implemented some basic stuff in Rust, not everything. Uh, we're going to see, actually, that Rust is not usable for what we want to do. One thing about Erlang is Erlang has built-in big num arithmetic, so uh, you don't have to worry about integer underflow and overflow. Um, Rust, I looked up Rust big num arithmetic. Again, I'm not an expert in Rust. Um, I found some like GitHub projects that didn't look maintained, but it doesn't look like it's, per it's built into the language. Erlang, big nums are built into the language. You don't have to worry about underflow and overflow. Okay. Um, and we'll talk about what that means next time. Anyway, <clears throat> so I want to give you a warning. Learning Erlang will permanently change the way you think about reality. Just going to tell you that. And when you have your childhood innocence cracked about concurrency, don't say I didn't warn you. All right, that's all I have to say. Next video, we are... Gonna, I'm going to convince you of point star, that any common divisor of two integers divides their GCD. And then I'm going to explain the Euclidean algorithm, and I'm going to show you some code I wrote. Um, there's a GitLab that I'll try to remember to link down below. It's, it's the gitlab.com slash dr.ajkumar slash qanal. 
Okay, what, what all do I have to link? I have to, anyway, doesn't matter. I'll figure that out on my own. See you in the next video. Bye-bye. Founder loves you.